Good morning, and thank you everyone for attending our latest version of our Let's Explore webinar. These are a series of webinars and when we're allowed to do them again, physical events that aim to be educational and to help people in the fleet industry to make the correct decisions. They're not looking at our products in particular detail. They're looking at partners and overall technology adoption uh, capability. So if we look ahead to what we're talking about today, We've got um, a number of presenters from partner companies that we work with, um, and also a particular deep dive um, into an area of heavy, heavy goods vehicle abnormal load routing. So we're gonna start with Leslie, who's gonna give a sort of belt and braces operator level view of a particular topic, which is bridge strikes. It may be a narrow topic, but the areas around best practice there, what can go wrong, what to do to avoid it, are very much uh, wider across the industry in terms of avoiding other issues. And she's a very experienced speaker, runs her own transport company and also her own webinar series. I'm then gonna do a piece on overall technology adoption. Some of the lessons that we've learned from watching customers get it right and get it wrong. Um, and I was wondering earlier, how many customers I've seen. I think in my 12 years here, I've seen about a thousand different companies, around half of which have heavy heavy vehicles. So there's a lot of different feedback we see from, from different customers there. I'll then hand over to Claire, who's from Cascade Software. They're specialists in abnormal load routing. And then to Joe in our team here, who'll summarize at the end. For those that are unfamiliar with the GoToWebinar platform, I would please ask if you could enter your questions in the chat box. We'll be muting um, everyone on the call, so we're not gonna ask for, for, for voice questions. But if you could please type in any questions, anything at all into the chat box, we will be monitoring it throughout the session. We will have a session at the end um, and answer those if we have time, and we'll get back to people individually if we don't have time at the end. So please use that. And now, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Leslie um, from Freight Train, is going to talk about bridge strikes and how to avoid them. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you. And I'd like to start with showing you a quick video uh, clip. And I'd like you, whilst you're watching this, this clip, to ask yourself the question, what is your strategy for the prevention of bridge strikes? Are your drivers your strongest asset or are they your weakest uh, link? Alan, can I ask you to show the video clip, please? Oh, there they are, a roadworks person there. So as you can get through to the yard. You can get, I can't even see down the fucking road. Uh, diverted traffic, yeah, my fucking road. Yeah, Paul just said that. Yeah, Paul just said that. So the driver, he passes the instruction for the road in it. He knows there's a bridge ahead. He continues. It's a fucking bridge here with a sign on it. I can't see what height it is. That's all right. This will go under that. According to the map, the bridge, the road goes over the bridge. I got a box straight on, mate. Is it an updated map? Yeah. Yeah. So at the end of the day, we're relying on our drivers. And as I said, are they our strongest asset or are they our weakest uh, link? And I sometimes think it could be, oh, sorry. 
a monopoly game. And so we're telling our drivers, please avoid Watling Street in Hinkley at all costs, because that is the bridge that has been hit the most times. In fact, 25 times in 2019. And secondly, Rockford Road in Dudley, because that is the bridge that has the longest delay for passengers. In fact, 72 hours. And it doesn't matter who we are and how big we are. It could actually happen to all of us. And we are reliant on our drivers and our policies and our training to avoid. And a bridge strike can absolutely impact on our uh, reputation very, very quickly. So this is a bridge strike back in 2012, and I'm still showing this in slides in 2021. And this is Mickle Bay Bar in, in York, which dates back to the 11th century. In fact, King Richard II declared that monarchs who wanted to enter the city of York could only enter by this bridge. Imagine not only the impact on reputation, but the costs for repair. And this course, you will, you will all know, this is the stagecoach disaster um, last year when a 14-foot uh, coach tried to go under a 12-foot bridge. What was the planning for that journey? What had the driver done wrong? Were they, was the company at fault or was it indeed the driver? And so much strong is this problem that Network Rail carried out an investigation and they've advised us that actually there are on average five bridge strikes per day. And this increases to 14 at certain times of year. And this predominantly is when the clocks change in, in October. And it's not surprising that Network Rail have now decided that they are going to recover all costs. Wouldn't you? if the cost to your company was in the region of 23 million per year. It is understandable that now Network Rail are reporting all bridge strikes to traffic commissioners and seeking to prosecute. And this is the result of Network Rail's um, investigations. And again, I'd like you to ask yourselves a question. Is it the driver at fault? or what involvement is it with the company? So errors in vehicle loading, is it the driver? Is it the planner? Is it the actual people loading the vehicle? Errors in measuring vehicle heights. Are we giving drivers the tool of the trail to measure the heights and is it part of their instruction? The errors in route planning, is it the driver? Is it the office staff? Are the people in the office asking their clients if there is a bridge in the facility? Failure to take heed of signs. Is this in fact local councils that aren't making signs um, as visible or are they obscured by overhanging branches and, and trees? And the poor signage at bridges, do network rail play a part as well? And poor vehicle alignment, are we actually assessing drivers when we employ them and are we carrying out ongoing assessments? So when we look at these statistics, are companies in fact to blame as well as drivers in not giving the instruction to carry out the heights of their vehicle in measuring? And if drivers don't even consider the height of their vehicle, is that the company to blame? For not being part of the process when they're starting their journey at the beginning of the day. And so we need to, well, sorry, we need to consider, my mouth is a little bit, um, right. we need to consider the impact for us transport companies. We cannot afford to, avoid, to ignore the impact on us. If we are at public inquiry, obviously our operator's license can be reduced, suspended or revoked. And what is the impact on that on our operation? Are we making redundancies? If we are the transport manager, does that mean that our employment is at stake not only with our current company, 
for our future employability. And of course, a massive impact on insurance. We all know that little knots here and knots there and side swipes can actually uh, send our insurance sky high. But a bridge strike could actually result in our insurance being totally revoked and, and, and the impossibility of continued trading. And should we neglect in telling our drivers of the consequences? And because, of course, we all know we have a driver shortage. And can we um, actually sustain an increased lack of drivers? So we need to be telling drivers that their license is also at stake. They also risk being unemployable. And it also impacts on their own insurance. And are we telling them that? And of course, um, at a time when we are all suffering but with our mental health, the actual impact of a bridge strike and the consequences on their pride uh, would be catastrophic. So much is the, or so great is the problem of bridge strikes that last year traffic commissioners updated their statutory guidance and they included collision with infrastructure as a reason for drivers and companies to be called to public inquiry. And they stated that the majority of collisions may be avoided if caused a result of negligence, the driver, and poor training, the company. And they stated with very clearly that drivers and companies could be called to public inquiry. And for the driver, they could have their voc vocational license suspended for six months. So what are we going to do? What practically can we do? And if we think that the vast majority of operators in the UK have less than 15 vehicles and may not be able to invest in um, fabulous IT and an app, what are just the basic things that we can do that are not gonna cost us too much money? So, Last year, the Senior Traffic Commissioner sent a letter to all operators telling them what they could do. They could assess, they could plan routes. They should ensure that their uh, planners and drivers have that training. So are you giving the training to your drivers? Are your people planning uh, routes? And are we giving them the necessary information? Operators should ensure that drivers have access to height conversion charts. Have you done that? Ensure that sites of height measuring gauges. Have you done that? Ensure that all people know the established running height of the vehicles. Have we done that? These are things that aren't too expensive to do. So is everybody aware of what we can do and how we can all play a part. I've added on to that some additional tips. So are we including the prevention of bridge strikes at induction before we even allow a driver to go on the road? When we're taking an order from clients, are we asking if there are bridges in the vicinity in order that we can advise drivers and plan our routes? accordingly. And when we've given drivers all of this instruction, are we auditing them to make sure that they're actually adhering to company regs? So as part of our gatehouse checks, are we checking that drivers have recorded the height either on their paper walk-around checks or on their app or whatever system you may choose to use? Have you considered issuing drivers with height measuring poles? Because of course, they may be changing trailers at a customer's site, and how are they going to check what the height is? And do we have a culture where drivers feel that they can ask questions and we are actually assisting? Or do drive, are drivers saying, well, you can ring the office, but they never return your call, or they make us feel stupid and they belittle us? And if your drivers have satellite navigation systems and they have maps, are we checking that they are current? Are we providing them with them? 
And these uh, conversion tables that traffic commissioners say we should be giving drivers, are they in some book that is thrown in the back in their bag, or they, are they easily accessible that when they're approaching a bridge, they can easily check if they can go under that bridge? And of course, one of the weakest links for me is agencies. So if we are working with agency drivers, are they clear as well of what our procedures are? And are we certain that when they're taking our equipment out that is probably worth in excess of £100,000, that they are going to be safe on our roads? Or are we putting our reputation in their hands? So for me, introduce safe systems of work for drivers, communicate them, include them in a handbook, and promote a culture of collaboration where we're all working together. But if it all goes wrong, what's your disaster plan? This is my vehicle, seven o'clock on an evening, sitting just about to pour my first drink of the day and my transport manager sent me this picture. My heart jumped into my heart, uh, my head and thinking, oh my goodness, we've hit a bridge. In fact, we hadn't hit a bridge. In fact, the driver was following a diversion in order not to go under a bridge and hit a branch, which totally wrote off my trailer. I didn't believe at first that this had not been a bridge strike and all kinds of things were going through to my head what should I do? What should the driver do? What should my transport manager do? I knew that Network Rail would report it if it was a bridge strike. I knew that possibly the police would be involved. Did the driver know that he had to ring the bridge authorities and look at the plaque at the side of the, of the bridge? Had we advised insurers? What were we going to say? What shouldn't we say? And my question to you is, what is your relationship with your insurers? We know the importance of the golden hour to protect us, the driver and the, and the company. And it's really important that insurers are contacted immediately and that we don't run and hide. And an example here that I have is of a bridge that was hit in October 2018. The insurers were advised immediately and came out. And when they came out, they established that that bridge had been hit several times. In fact, it had been hit 18 times in the previous year. And what that did was mitigate the, the costs of the operator who hit this bridge. Of course, if there are injuries, it's even more important that we collaborate with insurers because they may need, they need to get um, a solicitor um, out there to make sure that we kind of get evidence before other parties and the drivers don't speak out of turn and they protect our interest. And so for me, a bridge strike isn't just the driver. It doesn't have to be a costly exercise, uh, which many operators just simply cannot afford. It's a responsibility of councils, network rail, planners, loaders, drivers, insurance companies, all working together to keep our roads safe. And so here are my top tips for operators. Ensure that when we're doing our annual risk assessments, we include bridge strikes. We introduce safe systems of work that don't just sit on our shelves, that they are living documents and that drivers follow them and that operational staff follow them. We train drivers and office staff and we include that at induction. When we're speaking to customers or when we visit customers, we're actually carrying out risk assessments and we're asking if there are bridges in the vicinity. And probably one of the most important things is that we have a collaborative culture where drivers feel that they can ask and we're not putting them under pressure that they will take routes just because they need to get to the customer when they know that those routes, or maybe they don't know whether those routes are safe. We instruct drivers never to automatically follow 
diversions. And there are instances where drivers have followed diversions and actually they have not been safe for heavy goods vehicles. We have a disaster plan because unfortunately, um, the worst can happen no matter what we put in place. Because although we want drivers to be our strongest asset, unfortunately, they can be our weakest link. So I hope I've given you some tips to ensure that a bridge strike doesn't happen to you. And I'd like to pass you back to James. Thanks, Leslie. I'll just uh, let Alan take control. I just switched my camera off and back on again since it's now upset. And the bridge strikes is a subject close to my heart. Actually, that um, bus you showed in Winchester, my daughter was in the car following that bus. And if she got out of bed slightly earlier that day, she would have been on that bus. And various of my um, scouts, because um, I used to be a scout leader in Winchester, people I know very well were on the bus. And it was a miracle that no one was killed actually on that day. So it can be very close to your heart. However, when we get to Claire's presentation later on, we'll see that if you're dealing with abnormal loads and excess weights, it can be even worse. You know, you could collapse a motorway bridge or some piece of, of serious infrastructure. So thank you very much for that, Leslie. Um, great to hear about the sort of practical ways that we can avoid um, something as serious as that. And to talk about some of the principles that actually lead into technology adoption overall. So now I want to talk briefly about how to adopt technology and a quick overview of what's driving change in the transport industry and also how we can deal with that and how we can see it as something that we can benefit from and not worry about. So I'm going to talk about um, fleet technology trends. Sorry, same uh, <laughs> go to the webinar, like a little pause and you press a button. So fleet technology change, what, what's actually driving change in the industry? Some of it's obvious, some of it's less obvious. And I think if we have a good understanding of how it all fits together, you'll know which way to go. Then what do we see in the market? I mentioned earlier, I've personally visited around a thousand customers um, in my time here. About half of those are operating heavy vehicles. I've been in field technology sales for, for over 25 years now, and it's very different visiting customers. It's one of the reasons I like a sales job. You get to go out and meet interesting people and their ways of adopting and dealing with change are very, very different. So just some, some pointers there about how to do it the right way and how to make sure that what you adopt as a technology is right for your business and helps you rather than seeing it as a pain. So one thing we do see a lot with the, the heavy vehicle industry is that technology change is often forced. Digital tachographs, schemes like FORS, direct vision standard, they're forced upon our customers. And there'll only be more of that. Now, it may be unfair when you look at the very low MOT failure rates of a heavy vehicle, for example, compared to a van or a car. When you look at the professionalism of the drivers compared to private drivers, it's pretty unfair that you're such a focus for, for this kind of legislation, but you're an easy target, unfortunately. You're driving big, heavy vehicles, you're professional drivers, you're driving for a company, often with the company name down the side. There'll only be more of this kind of forced technology adoption. And what I would say is don't see that as a pain. See it as a way you've got to adopt technology, you've got to do something. So why don't you take that chance to actually sit down and think, well, if we're going to have to make a load of change here, couldn't we do something that actually benefits the business? What can we do that will improve our profitability and our operational efficiency and not just do the minimum? So my main advice there will be don't do the minimum required. Use that enforced change to sit down as a company and look at what you need to do to make the company more efficient. Because one of the main drivers for change now and one of the main drivers for technology adoption in anything transport related is customer expectations. Whether you call an Uber, whether you order a Domino's as I did at the weekend, whether you've got an important delivery coming from someone like Amazon or DPD, you know now as a consumer exactly where it is, exactly when it's going to be with you, who's driving, what's going on. Unfortunately, it's not good enough now to say, ah, oh, it'll be three days. And then on the day, where's my vehicle? We don't know. We're not calling our driver, it's dangerous. You'll, you'll, it'll get there when it gets there. 
unfortunately it'll get there when it gets there is not a customer experience that people are used to in their private lives now and that's changed the whole b2b marketplace as well people expect that kind of dpd type experience and that of course is potentially a big threat to small transport companies thinking well how do we get that kind of experience how do we put in place technology that lets us pretend to be an amazon or a dpd and that's a major driver for technology adoption in our customer base as we see it now and of course that's not even getting into the truly disruptive technologies and also the way that legislation can change things so quickly today i was just reading this morning that um, they're considering banning short haul flights in france if you can take a train journey of, of less than two and a half hours to, to, to change it we've seen what's happened with um, internal combustion engines in the uk they put in a very bold date saying pure internal combustion engines will be banned by this date then they brought it forward by five years and that change will be coming to your sector it may be more difficult to do it for trucks but whether it's hydrogen fuel cell full electric vehicles platooning as we see in the central picture there of putting multiple vehicles running them close together for long routes or on the bottom of there on the bottom right a fully driverless vehicle these things are all coming and if you think it's too difficult or it can't be done i'm afraid it will happen technology change these days is combinatorial which is a, a very complicated word but basically means as people make lots and lots of different discoveries and someone invents a camera someone else invents a type of processor someone else writes a bit of software that can interpret what the camera can see and give you results the combined effect of all the different developments going on around, around the world is very very fast change and we see that technology adoption is a logarithmic or rather the, the technology adoption that people expect in a business is a logarithmic scale so if you look at that graph people expect the pace of technology change to stay about the same and oh yeah we change our computer systems every five years and maybe we look at a new telematics platform every three years and we do this and we do that unfortunately technology changes exponentially the pace of technology change gets quicker and quicker and quicker and we have both the benefit and the curse of living in a time when that is accelerating beyond any kind of imagination and yes you could say oh it's a bit too difficult to do driverless vehicles in the uk the roads don't suit it but there's a there's a type of um scale of computing power that looks at what you can buy for a thousand dollars before long a thousand dollars of computing power will buy you about the same processing capability as a human brain but yet only around the turn of the century it was the same as an insect and the scary thing is that 20 years after a thousand dollars will buy you the processing power of human brain a thousand dollars will buy you the processing power of every human brain on the planet and that's scheduled to be somewhere around 2040. so if you think a vehicle couldn't possibly drive down a road without a driver well what if it had a computer on there that's as powerful as every human brain on the planet put together and it doesn't read text messages while it's driving and it doesn't get upset because it's had a bad night's sleep and so on its attention is on the road the whole time it will happen it may seem too difficult but unfortunately the world is littered with companies who thought oh this won't happen phones won't change people will always want videos at home there's loads of examples where people just don't accept how fast change will come the only thing you can always be sure of is that there'll be more change faster than you thought so what does that mean for how people adopt technology in the real world well we at webfleet did a study back in 2018 looking at what the barriers of adoption to technology and business were and there's a good infographic about this if you reach out to your your webfleet contact we can supply that to you with some, some feedback but i've took, put two parts of it on there the top left and the bottom so what's the main barrier to adoption of new technology cost is seen as the obvious one and then you've got difficulty of introducing systems and resistance among workers and that's very familiar to me having been selling all sorts of technology solutions most of my working life that's what you come across in the marketplace it's too expensive it's too difficult we don't want it and that's valid but it 
it won't fly in, in, the, in the modern world. There has to be a solution to that. So technology is often seen as a costly and difficult proposition. And the first thing I did when I spoke to Leslie about the bridge tracks, I said to her, you, know, you do realize that there's, there's technology, there's solutions out there. We do sat navs, we do devices that can tell you if you're driving towards a, 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 a low bridge. It won't plan a route under the low bridge. And if you ignore it and drive towards it, it'll beep at you. Uh, and Joe will show some more of that later on. And the first thing she said was, yeah, it's too expensive. And of course, that's, that's the ground view. You're working in a very low margin environment and, and technology is expensive. But that mindset needs to be changed to see it as a benefit that will make you more profit as a business and pay for itself. Because that's what technology should be for. It should be a tool to help you adopt your business goals. The other massive thing we see with technology is people saying, I've got too much data. I'm overwhelmed by the data. We don't put enough resource into analyzing the data. We don't think the data is right. It's confusing. And that's a, a massive thing we see in telematics. I had, when I was in, in frontline sales for Webfleet um, for my first seven years here, I had the meeting over and over again where I said, okay, so, so why am I here? Well, we've got, we've got a telematics platform, but it didn't save us anything. And I say, oh, that, that's interesting. You can tell me about that. And we have a conversation around how they bought that system. And it wouldn't have made any difference whether it was our platform or anyone else's platform. It was the way the technology was adopted that was the problem. There wasn't enough management buy-in. There weren't enough roles assigned to individuals as to who was responsible for what. And then the data wasn't valued. And quite often you see some competition within the business where one department wanted something, another department didn't. Some strong characters did want the technology, some strong characters didn't. And you see a situation where there's conflict and actually it's much easier just to ignore the data and carry on doing what you've always done. So if I was gonna summarize how to adopt technology, any technology the right way, and this is purely my own thoughts on it, not, not got this from the internet anywhere, then this is how I'd recommend you do it. First of all, think about what the business reasons behind that technology adoption are. You may have been forced to buy cameras for the direct vision standard, but what more could you do with that? Could you buy cameras that link into another system and give you value? Could you show some of that footage to, to customers? Could you use the information from the cameras in combination with telematics information to do something you've always wanted to do? What are the business challenges you face and what could you do with that technology to really improve your business and make it more profitable and more efficient? That needs to come from the top level of the business. If you are a business owner, great. If you're not, make sure you get the buy-in of the key decision makers and make them see it as something that will improve the business. You're not buying a platform to do this, a transport management system. What you're buying is the ability to do more orders with the same size of fleet. What you're buying is the ability to bid for different types of business because you can talk about your green credentials and that may be something you need to, to, to go for for certain types of business. Don't talk about it as technology, talk about it as a way of improving your business. Then the second part, the absolutely critical part that we see over and over again doesn't happen, get buy-in and assign responsibility. Once you've worked out why you're buying the system, so make it very basic, it's telematics, and you want to reduce your idling and you want to improve your fuel consumption. Whose job is it to measure that? Who's responsible if your idling hasn't improved in three months time? You need to define a role to every key driver behind that adoption and make it absolutely explicit that that person's responsible for that. Write it down, put it in their job description, have meetings about it beforehand and during. Because I've lost count of the number of times I've, I've been to see companies in this job and others where certain departments, often the IT department or the IT person wasn't involved. And they resent now having to update this transport management system and these sat navs and having to do this and having to do that because they weren't even involved in the process. So make sure everyone sits down and you say very clearly, this is why we're buying this and this is what it's going to do for the business. That makes us all more secure in our jobs. It makes us more profitable as a business. It helps us grow. This is why we're doing it. And then at the bottom there, choose solutions that talk to each other. That's the way to get around the sort of scary influx of startups into the industry and all the technology change. If everything you buy 
has the capability through technical things like APIs, basically it's software that can talk to other software, then you've got a future-proof system. If everything you buy is dumb and won't talk to other systems, then it's very hard to move on if someone wants more data. If someone like an Amazon moving into transport, that's both a risk to you guys, but it's also an opportunity. When these well-funded startups first come into the market, they often need help with their transport. Their longer term goal may be, we'll have our own transport fleet, our own vehicles, our own drivers, but they can't do that straight away. So if you've got systems that can accept their jobs and send them back information about the status of their jobs so they can integrate seamlessly with a third party, even if that company, say it's Amazon, we, we had a, a big deal with Amazon many years ago, and then they went and built their own fleet. But we knew that was happening. The thing you do then is you take that knowledge from working with them to another startup. The next time someone speaks to you about outsourcing their transport temporarily, you say, well, yeah, we've done that. We did it for X, Y, Z. We learned this. We've got these systems in place that can link with third parties. And this is what we did before. And here's our recommendations about how you can do it even better. If all your systems talk to each other and have the capability to be connected to other systems, that makes you much, much more future proof. And it gives you the ability to make an opportunity out of potential threats because you become the specialists in working with people who temporarily need to outsource fleet while they build their own fleet. That puts you in a very different position as a business to a, a, you know, a standard transport company that may be doing things on paper. And lastly, you need to value the data that comes out of technology systems and make the changes that are required. You know, this is a loop. This is a change process. You need to put the right systems in, but then use that data. Absolutely value the data at the top level of the business. Make sure the senior management sit down with that data, understand it, and actually make decisions based around it. Because without interpreting the data the right way, you won't make those savings. And I always say to people when I meet them about telematics, if you don't use this data to change human behavior, don't bother. Because there's no point putting a technology system in if you're not going to value it, look at the data and then drive change. It's got to change human behavior at the end of the day. And that is a challenging process. And that needs the whole company working together and all of you knowing why you bought it and what the goals were in the first place, which makes this a, an overall loop. Now, I'm going to hand over to Claire, um, who's from Cascade Software, to talk more about abnormal load routing, which is a very specific area, something we've not worked with much in the past, but we're talking to them now about uh, specific integrations here. and something that I know lots of you as operators do have to deal with on a daily basis. Thanks, James. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have been involved in abnormal lo load routing. I'm gonna give you a sort of a very quick overview of what it's about, how you do it, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're looking to do in the future, which is not only going to affect have normal load routing, but also ultimately will have a knock-on impact, I expect, to um, large freight moves as well. So just a little bit of background. We are Abnormal Load Anorak at Cascade Software. Um, we've been doing this for about 30 years. At the bottom of the slide there, you can see the authorities where we actually work on behalf of each of those local authorities, checking abnormal load notifications that come in and approving them or rejecting them. I'll talk a little bit more about the process of notifying an abnormal load on the next slide. But currently, we project to protect assets at around £65 billion. Now, this has actually got quite a link into Leslie's um, presentation in terms of bridge strikes, but also what we're protecting is uh, is uh, gross vehicle weights and actual weights going over those structures. 65% of hauliers actually use our software to submit, submit abnormal load notifications to um, police authorities and, and structure owning authorities. So what is an abnormal load? Well, an abnormal load cannot be divided. So you can't put um, two excavators onto one truck at 30 tonnes each, gross vehicle weight 60 tonnes, and expect to get away with that. Um, if if the, the load totals over 44 tonnes, it's 
got to be uh, notified to um, structure owners and to police authorities based on its width. We work within some legislation called the STGO, the Road Vehicle Authorization of Special Type General Order 2003, otherwise known as the STGO. So it can't be indivisible. Based on a weight, we've got three different criteria for abnormal loads. Anything over 44,000 kilograms is defined as an abnormal load. I've put 80,000 kilograms and 150,000 kilograms because they are subject to different notice periods when you want to move something based on that weight. We also have mobile cranes. Now, a common misconception is that a mobile crane is an abnormal, isn't an abnormal load. If an axle weight exceeds 12,000 kilograms, it becomes an abnormal load. And actually, when we start looking at the analysis for structures, moving a small 36 ton mobile crane over a structure with very close axle spacings can actually have more of an impact on a structure than an 80 ton low loader uh, spread over 12 or, or, or eight axles. So mobile cranes are subject to the legislation. If you're moving a vehicle that's over a, a loaded vehicle with a, over a three meter width, that also becomes an abnormal load. Five meters and 6.1 meters, again, I'll go on to that, but uh, that is subject to different notice periods. Anything over 18.75 meters long becomes an abnormal load. And here's the killer. Although height is defined and mentioned in the STGO legislation, there is no statutory limit um, for notifying a high load uh, within our legislation. Now, if you're completing an abnormal load notification, you have to put the height down, and it is checked by police authorities and structure owning authorities as a duty of care, but there's nothing that says if your height is over 4.5 meters, you have to submit an abnormal load notification, which is strange based on the fact that actually all we see with abnormal loads and legally focused on this is bridge strikes based on the height of the vehicle. So how do you move an abnormal load? Well, the first thing you've got to do is actually plan the route that you're gonna take. Now, that's not easy. You need to plan your route in order to cost that route in order to provide that cost back to your ultimate customer. But if we look at London, moving an abnormal load through London, these are abnormal load restrictions through London. So you can't just take a, a straight route from A to B. And just so you can see, if you're looking in London, you can't go via Hangar Lane. You can't use the M4 eastbound elevated section. You can't use parts of the M25, all band weight limits even things like the Dartford Tunnel. So you do need to have knowledge on the weight limit, the height limit, and the width limit for moving an abnormal load. Once you've decided the route that you're gonna take, you have to identify all the owners of the road, all the owners of the structures, the police authorities, and any road works that are happening at the time that you actually want to move your abnormal load. So I'm just going to give you an example here. This is an area of Rochester. And what we've actually got there are 18 structures that that abnormal load is crossing just in a very small geographical area. And what we've got here is six structure owners, all that have to receive an abnormal load notification because that, uh, that structure is being crossed. Once you've plotted your route and you've identified all of the structures and who owns those structures, you then can submit a notification. Your notification has got to be based on your weight, your width, your length, and your height. Now, if you're looking to move your excavator and you've taken a booking at 4 p.m. That, that afternoon for delivery the next day, if it's over 44 tons or over four meters, three meters wide, you can't move it for two clear working days. So if you've taken that booking on a Monday, you can legally actually deliver it to your customer on the Thursday, Tuesday and Wednesday being the two clear working days. 
If your load's over 80 tonnes, you're looking at five days and two days to police authorities. And anything over 150 tonnes is a maximum notice period of eight weeks before you can move it. And the same based on width. Anything up to three metres, you've got to give two days notice. Anything over five metres, it becomes 10 days. And anything over 6.1 is eight weeks. And length is similar. Anything over 18.75 is two days. So when you see adverts for crane hire delivering the next day, plant hire delivering the next day, you've got to question whether they're actually complying with the FCGO. If they are delivering a crane with any axle over 12 uh, tonnes axle weight or exceeding three metres in width. Once you've submitted your notification, you then have 44 different police authorities across the UK that all have very different rules about moving abnormal loads. So each abnormal load, depending on the police authority that you're working with, defines moving uh, under self-escort or police escort in different lengths. There's no set criteria. So it's really a minefield. You can't move, for instance, during peak traffic periods. So if you're on the M1 in Nottinghamshire, you've got to get off it in winter by 3 p.m. because you can't move um, after 3 p.m. there. Days of the week are restricted. So for instance, any abnormal load movement going through Dorset cannot happen any weekend after the 25th of June and before the 6th of September. So there's a lot of planning involved in, in even just moving that small 36 mobile, 36 ton mobile crane. Because of all the legislation, the rules, the notice period, the hard work that abnormal load hauliers have to go through and the hoops that they have to jump through, that's why compliance is only at 60%. Because compliance is only at 60%, we all get to see the visible consequences. This is a footbridge that was taken out um, on the M20. Um, we obviously saw the bridge collapse in Genoa in 2018, where 43 people died. Obviously, one of the slides I'm showing you here is the visible consequences of, uh, of no notification. Again, you can see the tailbacks here. I wanted to put this picture in because one thing that other panelists mentioned was the ability that drivers could divert away from bridge strikes or accidents. If you are moving an abnormal load, you cannot divert from your notified route. So if a police officer says this road's closed, you need to take this road, you are actually then becoming illegal because you haven't actually checked the structures or notified those structure owners that you're taking that route. So it really is a minefield for abnormal loads. The main issue with um, consequences is the invisible consequences. And again, I talked about the bridge collapse in Genoa in 2018, which was a result of underinvestment in bridge maintenance. And I'm just gonna show you in a few examples in, in this country. So coming off the N25, a, a key abnormal load route to, uh, to get down to the docks in Dover. But because of lack of maintenance, Abnormal loads were banned from this structure owned by Highways England back in 2018. So abnormal loads were routed through a Kent County Council um, area where a structure called Hedge Place was based. So just as in comparison, 2018, 433 abnormal load movements took place over Hedge Place. 2019, that had gone up to over five and a half thousand. The invisible consequences of that was that that structure then needed maintenance and so no abnormal load movements were uh, permitted to cross that structure either. What that meant was that there was over a hundred mile diversion because abnormal load movements couldn't go over either of those structures. Without bridge maintenance, those structures, the weight permitted on them reduces further and the invisible com consequences of this is affects everybody, all abnormal load routes, and ultimately, potentially um, even lighter vehicles as well. So what's the abnormal load industry doing to try and get that 60% compliance increased? Because if we can get that to 100% compliance, the amount of bridge maintenance actually reduces because we are managing those heavy loads 
and we're checking that the actual structure can, can take those axle weights and the spacings moving across that structure. So what we're doing is that uh, James mentioned data. Data exists in, in three areas at the moment, and that's what we're working with. When you have a, a vehicle, an, a, a, an articulated vehicle, an abnormal load vehicle, we understand the man, manufacturer data. So maximum permitted axle weight loading, maximum permitted gross weight of the vehicle. Take, take from that weight in motion data, which is now proven with accuracy. West Midlands Police ran a, a, a trial a couple of years back in terms of actually checking. So weight in motion data is very, very accurate now. And what we're looking to do is combine that with ANPR data. So as a, a, an abnormal load vehicle moves along its route, and, and this amount of data can be captured at any point of the outward journey when that loaded vehicle happens. We suck the weight in motion data out, and we suck the ANPR data out, and we check whether an abnormal load notification is actually being submitted. If it hasn't, we can transmit that information to the local police authority, who can then take roadside action against that haulier. We can also check whether we've actually had an abnormal load notification uh, be submitted to us, whether that's to the police or any of the local authorities or highways in wind areas across the country. And what happens is if we haven't had that, the haulier uh, gets a black mark against their, uh, their risk score. And if you look at something like Ford, work is being done in the background to police abnormal load movement being delivered to site. So as an example, Hinkley Point Power Station won't accept a movement unless they've received a copy of the notification and they've checked that they're happy that that's done legally. The next thing that we do is we look at the weight in motion data. Now, when I went back to the notice period about moving abnormal loads, anything up to 80 tonnes, you can give two clear working days. Anything over 80 tonnes, five clear working days. It's amazing how many abnormal loads are notified at 79.99 tonnes. So what the police and structure owners are looking at doing is to actually compare the weight in motion of each notified axle against the notifi notification to see whether they're increased or they're, they're decreased. And again, what happens is if they've under notified, roadside actions taken, a warning letter is sent off, their score is, uh, is reduced and therefore their uh, reputation with the large contractors, with the large delivery sites um, is affected. What we're also looking to do is, is work with hauliers so they can actually um, demonstrate proactive compliance. Again, and go back to the notice period of moving a crane. If you're actually showing that you're complying, local authorities and police authorities will work with you and allow that to happen at short notice. So you can book your plant by 4 p.m. and get it to the site the next day. If you can demonstrate that you're actually managing your compliance and your notification process correctly. So by sharing data, as James mentioned, uh, it means that you can accurately plot your route, bearing in mind an abnormal load route can be 100 miles longer than an HTV route or a car route. You can get your accurate fuel cost uh, back to your customer, so that the pricing for your job is, is much more accurate. You can manage your customer expectations um, for your projected driving time for your correct route rather than your assumed route. And what we're actually looking to do is to get that legally notified route into professional navigation solutions. So rather than the, the driver actually having to follow a piece of paper which shows the step-by-step -step route that has been included on the notification, it's actually embedded into his sat nav and uh, that takes him along the legally notified route. That's really important. And then finally, transport managers are able to actually retrospectively look at the route analysis and check that that driver did follow the legally notified route. Now, once this is in place, um, 
as a transport company or an abnormal load company, you're demonstrating complete compliance to any local authority or police authority. By doing that, um, you, uh, you're viewed as a brute haulier and you can move at short notice because everybody in the industry wants to work together. So structured owners and police authorities will cooperate and work with your business if you want to uh, if you, um, actually comply. So that's a quick lesson on abnormal load. Thank you very much. And I'm going to hand over now back to Joe. Hello, everyone. Okay, so we'll move on through now into a section um, for web fleets, um, specifically about how to adopt that truck navigation now in 2021, and I suppose a practical look at what technologies are available, drawing on some of the examples that James brought forward earlier on. So the way I like to think of it is the digital navigation process is kind of three key areas. We've looked, you know, a fantastic overview there from um, Claire in terms of how it's done from Cascade software in terms of abnormal loads but also for um, typical haulage journeys where um, they might use a combination of a planning system or a route optimizing system for jobs where the, the vehicle is within normal parameters, but actually it's about optimizing the efficiency of that. So either you have the manual planner planning out that route. And again, we've seen some um, great examples of how that's done and the complexities involved in that uh, from Claire, or you allow some software to do that optimization for you. Ultimately, then we move then into the implementation phase. So that's about knowing where the vehicle is, where the driver is, and where the route needs to go to, um, and ultimately getting that vehicle to its job on time and ar arriving in, inside the sort of specified time window. Um, and then at that point, we'll have the um, EPOD system um, potentially used by a number of um, hauliers now to effectively prove the delivery has taken place. And um, we'll cover that a little bit later on. And then the final phase, I suppose, really kind of um, the, the big kind of piece here is let's make this a really slick process so that delivery experience is better than competitors in your space so that the order fulfillment is quicker, the invoicing is smoother, and it's hopefully a pain-free journey for the customers. Okay, so in terms of route planning phase, um, we've obviously seen that the, you, know, you need to plan the routes as, as, uh, as in-depth in as you need to, whether that's A to B routing, uh, simple, um, kind of guided route, so to speak, and we do a lot of that in the sat nav space where uh, we take predefined, um, you know, we have the de de dimensions of the vehicle available, and therefore we can work around that vehicle in terms of the way it route it should take. But also we we can work with force routes from the likes of Cascade to be able to actually, you know, go make sure they follow that breadcrumb to the letter and don't deviate. And of course, a lot of the planning softwares as well look at vehicle loading and how to organize the parcels inside the vehicle and the and the, and the, the consignments so that actually when they arrive to their first job, the uh, the parcel's not at the rear of the vehicle, for instance, and can't be accessed. Um, we need to be able to understand the time constraints and delivery windows. We need to be able to understand and be able to notify councils and police, as, as Claire has already touched on, and um, ultimately be able to sort of optimize the routes around the, those dependencies. So, for example, if you have to be at a job by no earlier than 3 p.m., then obviously then you need to make sure that the preceding jobs allow you to get to you know, job number 14 or whatever by 3 p.m. And working around that can require some quite complex calculations. I think the thing where we sort of start to involve the driver now is, you know, do you really expect the driver to have to manage all of those dependencies and challenges without um, a navigation device to sort of take the burden off the driver? And I think that's where we start to see the route being delivered down to the driver through that navigation device. So I want to look at an actual practical example we saw from um, Leslie at the start. She talked about Watling Street. Um, so this is the A5 southbound, northbound, Hinkley and Nuneaton area. And um, what we see here is the, um, this is a view from Webfleet. If the truck here was under 15 feet, it would take the, um, the southbound route here um, and it would go underneath the railway bridge um, in this example. However, if I was to um, adopt and, and, and change the route in Webfleet in a second, you'll see how we would adjust this. If I was a driver actually approaching this from a, um, a southbound direction, you can see the signage, the low bridge sign, and also the 15 foot limits. And again, from the northbound direction, you can see whether the, the vehicles have to maybe do a U-turn or turn around on that gravel siding on the left. Um, if we plug into Webfleet um, specific route options, so in this case, the 
Um, the bridge is the same here in the centre between Hinkley and Uneaton. The height now is actually 16 foot for the vehicle. It's choosing then to divert the route around um, into the um, on the ring road around Uneaton on the A road and pick up at the M69. Yes, this route does take, I think, eight minutes longer, but um, obviously then the uh, impact is so much less and the um, yeah, we wouldn't have the instance we saw in the video in the first example, for instance. So in terms of HTV specific mapping technology, I think there's three key areas I'd just like to touch on and talk about a little bit. So the first we've just demonstrated there really is being able to avoid all non-HTV roads by vehicle size. So if you plug into WebFleet the length, the width, the weight, the height um, of the vehicle, it will then be able to take the correct route. And that's um, more or less, you know, avoiding urban centres, uh, avoiding tight turns, uh, avoiding turns across oncoming traffic, um, narrow roads or, or weight restricted roads, it will take the intelligent route. So if you've got um, a flexible route for the, for the day and the driver just needs a bit of help because they're out of the area they know, then this is their kind of their guide alongside them to help them through those and it will work with um, the road network. Um, for those operators that carry hazardous material routes, especially yeah. European Union operators, um, we can work with pre-designated routes in that sense. So we can toggle on and off for explosives or um, hazardous materials that are being transported. I think the thing that really matters to me most of all is seeing, you know, being able to be flexible around live traffic. I mean, a lot of um, the, the routes we plan are typically generated before the fact, and therefore you know roughly what the traffic might be at four o'clock on the M25. But actually, in reality, you don't know there's, a, there's an accident at Junction 5 or or, or anything else. And in this case, you know, we're so used to it in, in Google, in our cars, to be able to you know, move around that junction. If you're in a heavy vehicle, you just don't want to take the risk just in case you find yourselves on a back road that you can't fit down. So the, the benefit here is if you still have the filters switched on for HGV mapping, you can take the alternative route, but you can be safe in the fact that actually the, um, it's, it's going to notify you and avoid any of the, uh, any of the restrictions. So I suppose we move into the second phase, implementation. So for me, that means actually sending that job or order down to that driver then. So we've got our Pro 80 um, 475 navigation tablet. The image here shows a driver using that out in the field. And effectively, it's a way of managing the um, workflow with that driver. So um, you know, being able to know exactly where the vehicle is and what time they're going to arrive at that destination gives you such great amount of data then share back with your customer to improve that experience as well. We've got a number of um, third party integrators which take that and either produce a portal for the customer or a delivery time window text, which allows them to know exactly what time to expect their, uh, their delivery. And it, of course, it gives you a full audit trail. You can see there's sort of like a six step process this driver is going through in terms of accepting and starting that order. At every one, there's a timestamp, there's a location stamp, a date stamp. So you can see exactly what, what happened and when. And you can see when the driver's read it as well. So it just gives you a lot of detail about how that route's being managed and hopefully if the vehicle's going to arrive on time or not. So when the vehicle arrives, hopefully on time, then um, you know, we're all very used to now sort of seeing drivers jump out of the vehicle in our in our home lives and you know ask either for a voice signature or, or a photo ID to show that delivery. You know, in days gone past, it would have been a signature on glass as well. And um, I think that, you know, that's something that we can do through the BDA. So straight away, you're starting to collect signature on that consignment and, you know, be able to pass it into your you know, financing team to speed up that invoicing process. I think the final piece is just about, you know, um, driver well-being, keeping in touch with the drivers. And, you know, we don't want the drivers to be on their phones too often. So actually to have the nav up there, and if there's a group message that comes out and can be read out loud by the navigation device rather than the driver touching their phone at the wheel, and that's actually a huge benefit and keeps the drivers up to date, but within the confines of the law as well. So I suppose um, wh wh where this sort of comes to for me is, you know, I've looked at a little bit of research and I want to echo some of the comments that James had earlier on. Um, KPNG came out with, th with this report two years ago around the connected experience in transport and logistics. And I think what surprised me was that 80 percent of transport and logistics leaders so that their companies are focusing on improving the experience, but actually 85% can't actually find a differentiated experience to offer their customers. Um, and I suppose it's exacerbated right at the high end as well. So the top 25 you know, customer experience leaders could achieve five times earnings or seven times revenue growth in the bottom 25. So doing it well can be a huge differentiator in terms of um, you know, what's in the market and, and, and being seen as one of the better ones. Um, 
projects. So, you know, we reflect that in, in our own um, in our own surveys. I'm actually picking up on that survey that James um, covered earlier on. So, again, in this example, 74% of customers say they'd leave if they don't get specific times or time slots. And that's not in um, B2C world, that's in B2B world. And I think, you know, if you think about this, could you really risk that only 26% of your customers would actually reorder with you again if you just allowed the driver to turn up late and not be able to, to, to sort of give them any forewarning of when they arrived? And I think it illustrates to me the benefits and the need for the technology to link up the uh, activities behind the scenes. Um, so finally, and in summary, um, before we move on to questions, I just think that um, we've seen some fantastic presentations today um, from Leslie, from Claire, from James, and you know, a real kind of um, deep dive into the industry in terms of the challenges we'll experience um, as operators. And uh, I think you know the, the technology is, as we saw some quite startling graphics from James, it's only going to get more and more intelligent over time. So keeping abreast of it and keeping up to date with it, this type of content is really, really important. Um, so without further ado, I'll pass through to um, all of our panelists and we'll be able to take any questions. I've seen some great questions coming through just now. Thank you, Joe. Um, good presentation. So I don't want to take too long on, on the questions. I'm just looking at actually it looks like most of the attendees are still with us. So um, if people start to uh, to leave in their droves because we have gone over the hour, then then I'll, I'll draw it to a to a close. But I will ask a, a couple of questions that have come through. Um, just going back through the questions, first of all, maybe to Leslie, um, how do your drivers actually cope with that kind of system where they're allowed to give honest feedback? Do you find that they do engage and what do you do to actually coax out of them that genuine engagement rather than have them scared to talk about about issues? Well, I think what we've got to remember is that drivers are not another form of life and we should be dealing with our drivers and speaking to our drivers, engaging exactly the same as we do with our suppliers and our, and our customers and having that open conversation and, and it starts right from the recruitment, from the induction, so that, you know, if there is a, a, an issue further on in the employment, then that they, they feel that they come, and, they come and talk to you. You know, what is your, what is your office like? Do, do you have a separate room for, for drivers and, and drivers and office staff that they're that, that kept apart? Uh, is that the way we, we want it to be? Or do we actively kind of speak and, and, and go and chat uh, to drivers and, and when they when they have got an issue and maybe it's their issue not the company issue but when they have got an issue do, do we actually listen uh, to them um, it's very difficult because we're in a, a pressurized environment and often the only thing that we can think of is what's happening next but we've got to think that the drivers are our vital resource and we've got to allow them time to speak to us especially in an environment where you know it's hard to get hold of drivers so uh, it's difficult but yeah engage with them as you would um your suppliers and your customers because they are your internal supply chain that's a good way to look at them actually as as a type of customer so do you find you get more work from being more compliant and having fewer bridge strikes do you think it affects your profitability i mean what's the what's the impact there uh the only way you are going to get more work is giving a fabulous service and um, being compliant does help you to give that service because if you are compliant, your vehicles are safe uh, on the road, your drivers are safe on the road, they're not going to break down. So uh, we are an earned recognition operator. Uh, regretfully, nobody has come to me and said, um, we want to work with you because you are earned recognition. They normally say, we want to work with you because you give um, great service. But going back to the drivers, does a driver want to work with a company that is not compliant? If a driver is working for a company that overloads their, their vehicles, that aren't kind of respecting driver's hours, that aren't looking after the maintenance um, of, of their vehicles, are they going to feel safe on the road or will they want to go elsewhere? So look at being compliant as a way as well of, of keeping drivers and, you know, ensuring your reputation. Yeah, and I suppose for Claire, I mean, do you think with the 
AMPR cameras and, and, the, and the better enforcement of abnormal loads, we're going to see some quite significant changes in the industry in the next few years because clearly people are running in a non-compliant way. It may be they're doing that structurally if they're actually advertising that they can deliver things in a way that's not legally possible. Do you think there'll be a lot of changes yeah. in the next few years? I, I really feel for um, abnormal load haulers that are compliant because they lose so much business to, um, you know, if you take a plant hire company that actually complies and manages their customer expectations to say, you know what, you've ordered it today, so you can have it on Friday, they lose out business-wise to somebody who will take the booking and get it to them tomorrow and not notify. So I think working towards 100% compliance is just, it's just going to level out the playing field. And at the moment, those people that are legal, they invest the money and the time to make sure that they do it properly, are losing out to those people that don't. And that, that's not right. Uh, you know, that needs to change. It's about time. And I think Leslie will probably agree with me that, that people are rewarded for doing things properly, um, mm -hmm. you know, rather than penalised. So, you know, that's one of the reasons. I mean, we, we bang on about compliance, but that's to keep all routes open to all vehicles. You know, we're a small niche industry in abnormal loads, but, you know, an abnormal load movement can cause, you know, damage. A, a, a vehicle moving over a structure, abnormal load vehicle, is the same as several thousand cars going over that structure. So we have a, a moral and legal right to, to do it properly. Yeah. Because yeah. from what you've said, it looks like there may be some some quite significant changes in the industry in the next few years. And if people are monitoring AMPRs and making sure those routes have actually been notified in advance, then if 60% of people are complying, then that's a massive number that may be yeah, getting phone call or some kind of not, notification. It's not going to affect just abnormal load routes. Um, bear in mind that the, the software that, that we were talking about is, is CMU. You know, you've, you've still got to um, move under CMU rules for police. So it doesn't have to be heavy. And the software will still check, you know, any HGV's maximum axle weight or gross vehicle weight and compare that with the weight in motion data. It doesn't have to be an abnormal load. It can be any truck you know, on a motorway in, in England being checked. And that did happen a couple of years ago with uh, with a police authority actually trying this out. And, uh, you know, they had their roadside offices parked up the road, checking the maximum permitted axle weights against what the weight in motion was recording, pulling them over, you know, a mile or two up the road. So it's there, it exists. Yeah, all right, thanks, guys. I'll wrap it up there. We, we're, we're quite well over, which knowing the, the four of us was no surprise that we can uh, yeah. we can talk for an hour. Um, so thank you very much. Great contributions, Claire and Leslie. Really good to have some people from, from outside of Webfleet on these presentations, and it, it, it makes it so much stronger than if it's just us talking about uh, our own technology. Um, Let's Explore is a series of webinars aimed at different fleet types and physical events as well. So there will be more of these sorts of educational events um, at car fleets, van fleets, and heavy feats uh, for the rest of the year. So thank you very much for your time. I'd say to the attendees, thank you very much for attending. Um, please do send through any information you've got, any questions you've got to your Webfleet contact, whether it's your account manager, uh, your reseller, do get in touch with us. Um, you can find our contact de details very easily and someone will be in touch at some stage to, to have a conversation with you and just see if you've got any feedback. So thank you very much. Feel free to approach any of us um, with any questions and have a good rest of the day and rest of the week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.